motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo, often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host. Since we launched this podcast two months ago, we've had a fabulous response from women and some men from all around the world. And before we move on to this week's episode, I'd like to spotlight one of our listeners. This is Rebecca Boston of The Diversity Puzzle. She wrote to us on Facebook and I want to give Rebecca a really big shout out. Thank you ever so much for your kind words. Here's what she said. I'm really enjoying the breadth of mums that you have been presenting on the podcast. Teaches us all there's no one way to be a mother. Oh, Rebecca, that's music to my ears. Thank you ever so much. I'm really grateful for you tuning in and being a loyal listener. And I'm especially happy to hear when an episode hits home. But I know that you've been listening to... I'm pretty sure, because you said it in your uh, note, that you've been listening to every episode. So that is wonderful. And thank you for taking action and letting us know that you love our episodes. If you'd like to leave a review and possibly be a spotlight on this podcast, you can do so on iTunes or anywhere you listen to this podcast. I love to hear your feedback. I really do. So write to me at podcast at schoolformothers.com. That's podcast at schoolformothers.com. Before we go further, this episode is sponsored, you've guessed it, by MeSheets. It's a really simple but incredibly effective system to get mothers not only doing the things we want, but as important, if not more, MeSheets reinstall us mothers bang smack in the centre of our own lives. Now, mums have been using MeSheets now for many months, Some mothers have been using them for more than a year. And I have to say, I'm seriously thinking of recording some chat with them so that you can hear how bloody useful this simple download is. Watch this space. In fact, if MeSheets are making a difference in your life and you're using them regularly and you'd like to be part of a bonus episode on the subject of being central in your own life while being a mother, why don't you get in touch at podcast at schoolformothers.com It's going to be an exciting bonus episode. I just know it. My plan is to talk to mothers using me sheets all around the world because I happen to know that these sheets, this digital download, works for mothers living anywhere of any age, living very different lives. So if you'd like to be involved, write to me at podcastschoolformothers.com. And by the way, if you haven't already got your own copy of me sheets, in your hands, go to schoolformothers.com forward slash me sheets. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash me sheets. Enough about everything else. Let's get on to episode eight. I'm thrilled to be joined by Misa Mink for Drive. Misa is a co founder and chief doer of the network Driven Woman, Doers Academy, and a festival of doers. She's also mother of twin boys. Prior to creating Driven Woman, Misa was known as a highly accomplished branding professional where she successfully launched and grew startups. She's been featured on CNN Money, Huffington Post, London Live TV, The Sunday Times, and is a We Are The City Rising Stars winner 2017 in the diversity category. This episode is all about inner drive. I've got a feeling Misa is the perfect woman to ask about the differences between, let's say, feminine and masculine drive, as well as how to keep our drive really amped up, or do we have to? I know that as a mother with loads of kids, I really want to make sure that my energy is optimal. I, you know, it, it's nearly Christmas and boy, it's hard to keep drive all the time. And that's one of the things that I want to ask Misa about. So not Christmas, but how to keep optimal. Because I've got big visions, big ideas, and that needs me to be resilient. And I know that you're the same. You'll have lots that you want to do in the world, 
and in your life locally as well. And how do you keep that drive going? Let's hear what Misa has to say on this. So I won't make you wait any longer. Let's go ahead and dive into our chat with Misa. Here we go. So today's podcast episode is on a subject really close to my heart, which is called drive. I called it drive because I wanted more than anything to speak with Misa Mink, who's founder and chief doer at Driven Woman, which is a wonderful supportive network for women wanting to lead a bigger life. And I really am so excited that Misa's granted us this little space for a conversation. We're good friends. I have to confess, we know each other super well. But the reason I'm so excited is because I don't know anybody like Misa for this incredible force and drive that she has to make things happen in the world. Once Misa says she's going to do something, watch out world because boy, does she make it happen. So today, Misa, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure and honor. And thank you for your kind words. (laughs) You're welcome. You know, I'm not somebody that's a bullshitter. So I really, really mean them. I adore you. (laughs) And uh, that's what you do, you know. (laughs) So, So let's get started. So what I want to ask you is, what do you think women's relationship to drive is? What's it all about? Uh, Firstly, I think a lot of people confuse drive to doing. And drive is really, for me, it's about honoring your spark, your inner drive. It's really about being present with who you are and kind of your authenticity and your true story. Whereas people very often think it's about just mindlessly doing things or being a super achiever drive or being driven is it's opposite of drifting which is also a very active state Mm. a lot of women are drifters i'm afraid to say we are uh, people pleasers we want other people to love us we serve other people's dreams so when you drift you do a lot you are very active you you go through your to-do lists and you get lots done But actually, what you're engaging with is fulfilling other people's dreams and other people's demands. This gives you some pleasure, but at the end of the day, leaves you quite unsatisfied. But when you really honor your drive, you actually put yourself in the driver's seat. And what that means is that you start making active choices and how you're going to connect to your inner spark. And sometimes it means doing lots. Sometimes it does mean, very often it means action, but very often it means inaction and saying no and being quiet and choosing to be alone and things like that. So kind of going and connecting with that inner spark. So that's kind of sums up drive for me. And women's relationship with drive, with that inner spark, I think at the moment is a bit confused, maybe, because the world has recognized men's drive all these thousands of years, right? Yeah. And so we kind of worship that competitiveness and a kind of linear approach to drive. And a lot of women think that they don't have a drive because they don't have the masculine drive. And I think that's the key for women to understand is we all have that spark. We all have that inner drive and it just manifests itself very differently with different people. And the feminine drive is much softer. It can be about being intuitive or creative or it can be about beauty. It can be about collaboration. So it's recognizing that for women that uh, we all have that spark. And we just have to honor it. How do you, I mean, I love the description actually of the difference between the masculine and feminine drive and the spark and how society has really legitimized, I think, the masculine the way of having drive. And now we are beginning to understand that there are differences. But how did you find yours? It's a journey. So 
I think I've always recognized the spark. I wasn't maybe able to put my finger on it and say, this is exactly how I need to manifest myself in the world. But I've always honored my intuition. So I've been very good at listening to when the call comes. So to change a job, to move on, to take a challenge, to grab an opportunity. I've been very good at jumping into the unknown. And I think for us to really honor our spark and honor our drive, you have to be able to step outside of your comfort zone. Otherwise, you will not find it. So kind of to find your spark, you have to go digging. It's work. So you have to go digging. You have to go digging. You have to go digging. And not expect that every time you dig, you'll find a treasure. You know, it is a treasure hunt. And uh, there will be lots of frustration and going into territories unknown. But unless you do it, you will not find it. So I think it's very much about stepping outside of your comfort zone and being present with that intuition. Because the intuition tells you. You have it all the time. I think I think just most of us, we choose to be so busy that we don't want to listen. Yeah, exactly. So the treasure hunt and being prepared for the not necessarily a comfortable ride, but will lead you to, and so in parallel with really getting conscious and listening to your gut instincts, your intuition will lead you to your version of your in a drive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And one of the things I really love about what you're saying, Misa, is that some of the waves of your drive will be noisy, active, and very obvious. And other waves of that drive will be quiet, inactive, thoughtful, kind of to lay low. And to. I know that We've talked in the past, you know, about the cyclical kind of way of your particular drive in the world. Tell me a bit about that. So I, I, be, I very much believe that as we are part of the universe, we do tap into the cycle within us and around us. And unless we let ourselves ride on the waves, we spend way too much energy energy unnecessarily and very often confuse that for a drive, just being very active and not necessarily getting any results because we might be swimming almost against the, trying to go against the wind as opposed to let the cyclical nature of, of the universe to move us forward. But as we talked about the uh, getting quiet and listening to your intuition, then you can recognize that. So I think there's three parts on anyone's journey, or there should be. There's the doing. So unless you do the doing and go digging and step outside of your comfort zone and and do these, these things that you haven't done before. But also is the quietness, is the uh, intuition being present with yourself and not just struggling against against this cycle and and then there's the third part which is you got to fuel yourself so you got to go and find inspiration and find kind of food for your soul for your thoughts for your emotions for your spirit and you find this with other people from books, from seminars, God knows, you know, every, we, there's lots of sources we can find this fuel from. So for me, there's those three parts. And if you honor all of those three parts, then you can really tap into the, the cycle of the universe in a way. And your drive yeah. is much more sort of natural as opposed to kind of achieving and, and being really kind of hard and kind of not seeing what's going on and, and using a lot of energy. So so I would say those three elements are are essential. Totally. Got you. So the the doing and the being. Yeah, doing and being. <laughs> As you say the, the yeah. doing the stuff that's doing being and inspiration, the fueling. Yeah. Where do you get your inspiration and fuel from? You know, like specific places. What do you books or where recently? Where have you been able to do this? I'm quite past the, the book face. 
Yes. So again, there's phases. It's almost like, you know, you have to get this thing over with. You have to get something out of your system. I'm done with the books right now. That was probably nine years. So now I get my inspiration from nature, from people who are really open and truthful and honest and raw and vulnerable. And really also just being alone. I fuel myself in much more sort of earthy ways right now. But uh, in the past nine years, it was very much about research, books, seminars, you know, podcasts, really kind of getting the wisdom of the world, sucking it in. But now I'm processing it in, uh, in different ways. And I think it's very important to recognize that whatever you feel like, how you need to consume your food, your fuel, that's the right way. So nobody can tell you that, oh, you must read, you know, five books a month or <laughs> you must uh, have at least seven podcasts on the go. You know, I don't care <laughs> as long as you do the work and it, it feels authentic to you. So you need to, again, recognize that there is these different phases that you go through. Yeah, exactly. And and I love that you you're not saying that there's a certain quota or a formula or a model that you should be doing, otherwise you're not really fueling yourself. For me, what you're saying is that you're linking the being present with yourself and listening to your intuition very strongly and from there actually gathering the inspiration that your soul will tell you, you know, at the time when you need to basically voraciously take in other people's views well you know through books or seminars or teachings whatever then you'll know that that's the mode that you need to be in but when our soul says no I want to be alone I want to just sit in nature sit by the beach by water whatever it is walk you know it's that listening again and so there is something you mentioned there that I'd love to pick up on you also mentioned that you get your fuel and inspiration from people who are open and vulnerable and honest. And I think those were the words. I think you might have had another one in there as well. But so tell me, tell me what you mean. What for where you are at the moment and for you as founder of Driven Woman, why is that so important to you? It's quite interesting when you get into this space that you see what is happening when you when you almost only meet and deal with people who are ready to be open and vulnerable and they don't need any masks so they don't operate from the operation system of ego but from this inner spark because then uh, magical things actually start to happen because they every time I meet these people I know that they are there for a reason and there is some sort of a soul contract or a message or some wisdom why this person is here today, right now. And because I am open, they are open. It's, it, it's very quickly, the exchange is very quick. There is, no, there is no wasted time. Everybody knows what's going on. So that's a very fast fueling process, if that makes sense. Because there is no friction in between and sometimes it's it can be something beyond words so it, you how you receive this information you know and emotional well-being or somehow your soul connects and you 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 get a new understanding after meeting this person for instance and again mm. you can't put your finger on it yeah no i can hear that i can hear you <laughs> forgive the forgive the kind of um, basic uh, words here, but it feels like you're trying to grasp the words. You're in the vicinity of the words. You're kind of in the territory, but not quite there. And it's not because it's not actually because you don't know what you're talking about. It's because it's unnameable. Yes, it is unnameable. Yeah, it's a, it's a little like chemistry between people. Yes, and it it doesn't always happen. But you know, basically, what I mean is that when people are open. And there is no games going on. There's ego is not having a massive, you know, agenda. We, we communicate very quickly and we inspire each other very quickly because we don't, have, mm -hmm. we don't need to hide. 
we can tell our true stories. And I know that when I meet people who tell their true stories, I learn. So that, for instance, happens yeah. at, the, uh, at the life working groups at Drew and Woman. When we're completely open, it, within two hours, the amount of inspiration, fuel, and kind of positive thought that people have generated around the table is massive. So I get completely fueled up in terms of wisdom and energy and, and positivity when I meet people like that. Does that maybe give it a bit more flesh? Yeah, I do. I know what you're saying. It's funny because not long ago I was in conversation for a different um, episode um, called Masks. <laughs> and, and the episode it's, it was with Emma Stroud, who I know you know. Mm -hmm. And it was a phenomenal conversation about the role of masks in life and her experiences of unmasking and what that does for us as human beings, what, what is possible for us when we begin to strip away our masks. And as a clown and actress and, uh, and comedian, you know, obviously she deals with masks for characterization. And, and so it's a really fascinating conversation. So it's, it's wonderful that you're talking about, you know, that kind of dropping of masks and what that enables in terms of our, yours and our nourishment when we're willing to do that. So what do you do when you're, when you encounter people that uh, you don't necessarily think are on that wavelength? So, so for instance, are coming from ego, are playing games. What do you do, Misa? I probably don't do anything. At the moment, uh, it, people just pass me by. Our, our paths don't connect. So nothing, basically nothing happens. But do you meet people like that? Yeah, I probably all the time. They just don't get me and I don't get them and that's fine. And then everybody continues on their path. So it's very neutral, very neutral exchange. Yeah. I think, uh -huh. at least for me. Yeah, yeah, got it. So talk to me about Mother's Drive. So I think mother or non-mother, it doesn't differ. You have that spark. Everybody has the inner drive. But I think there's a little bit of confusion again because before you become a mother, you have initially you have a lot of energy. You have you know, physical energy, emotional, intellectual, financial energy. You're doing all these wonderful things. You have a wonderful career or you're building something or studying or whatever it happens to be. And kind of when you have children, especially if you have more than one, and talking to uh, women who are mothers, um, who are members, they say that it's normally the number two that really kind of throws them. The first one still, you know, they can still pretty much carry on in the old system, but um, I, you've experienced this more than many times, and I, I have twins, so I went also straight into the two, two kids scenario. So you kind of, all this energy gets sucked out initially, absolutely everything, and it's, it's the way of the world, and so it has to be. You have two of these beautiful, you know, new human beings, and they need your physical, emotional, intellectual, financial energy so that they can, they can survive. But then time passes and you think this is the new norm, that you have none of this energy anymore. And that's kind of where it all goes wrong. So for mothers, that they forget that all of that energy was theirs and it's still theirs. They are to lend it to, to the baby initially so that the baby can, you know, grow and gain some of their own strength. Mm -hmm. But after that, you actually, are, mothers are missing a huge opportunity because I think if they choose to honor their drive and go back looking for their drive, this inner drive, mothers would have a unique opportunity to be even more connected to their drive because they have now this new linked linked to life and they they're kind of part of this chain of life and the cycle of the universe which if they choose to say yes 
will make them more open, vulnerable, authentic, because they they are actually they can be more connected to this cycle, because now there is the next generation coming, and I I personally feel the kind of the connectedness opened up much more after having children. And I'm not saying that if you don't have children, you can't have the connectedness. Of course you can. But that can be a huge catalyst for mothers. And I see this all the time in our, in our groups, in our events, with our members, meeting lots of mothers, that this becoming a mother actually is the trigger to really kind of uh, unleash their true creative power. And they start to demand, if they choose to, if they, they go after their drive, they start to demand more from life and more from themselves. Let me quote one of our members in Switzerland. She said, the reason why she joined Driven Woman was, if I'm to leave my children behind to go to work, it has better be 110% matched with my value and my purpose. Mm -hmm. So now you have this other element that you, you love your children, you want to be present with them, you want to nurture them. So why would you then, you know, it's got to be worth it if you're, if you are then going to go and create something. And I think that's the opportunity. That's where women, when they become mothers, they can become even more connected with their drive if they, if they realize this shift. I don't know. What do you think? I think that becoming a mother laser focuses. And so at a very practical level, there isn't the luxury of uh, so much time to, to you know, maybe to drift, to become one of those drifters. And I mean, many, many people do be stay drifters. But if you've, if you've a sense of wanting to create something specific, and I think that's the, that's the piece that quite a lot of mothers lose, which is the, well, what is it I'm creating? Apart from my children, what am I creating in the world and why? For, for those women that do find that or already know it, then then they actually, or mothers, they actually really, there is an imperative that they have to get on with it. So they make things happen in smaller chunks of time, you know, often and mostly to better standards because <laughs> there's there is this societal um, question about whether women are actually ambitious or can really achieve too much once they've got children, which is absolute piffle. You only have to look around in the world to see that mothers are outstanding, you know, creating outstanding things in the world, inventing, leading companies, leading countries. You know, I mean, it, it's such piffle, but there's still a very, very powerful narrative that there's women's drive reduces and women's therefore ambition and achievements therefore reduce. And so I don't see that at all. I see those women that listen to that and believe it no longer work on their drive. They shift their focus. Yeah, they shift their focus often into their children. And for those women that want to do that, amen. Like, yes, you keep doing that. That's wonderful. I, I'd be the first to be behind that. You know, why not? But for those who really are doing it as a default because they don't, because they actually are being told that their drive will reduce and they can't do anything in the world, then no, that's, a, that's such a lie. And, you know, this podcast in itself is testament to that because each episode is, is a conversation with extraordinary, ordinary women who are living remarkable lives um, because they have drive and they're converting that drive into action. They're not just talking about it. They're actually doing something. Um, but they're also, they're also telling on themselves about what it takes to do that. So yeah, 
Um, I'm a great believer that mothers actually have more drive. Yeah, it's it's that uh, which narrative do you believe and do you listen to your self-doubt or do you listen to that initiative that we all have inside? So it is that choice, is left or right? Yeah, exactly. Which, which are you going to believe? Yeah, yeah, are you going to believe that you can't or are you going to believe that you can? Which, mm-hmm. whatever it is you want. Yeah, I was talking to this wonderful woman or I was listening to her this week actually and she was saying that she would dearly love her third child and her mother-in-law keeps saying well that's it you'll have to you'll have to stop doing what you're doing there's no way you can do it she's a multi-achieving entrepreneur and her children are at school and she was beginning to believe it she was actually believing it myself and another woman you know she has three children and I obviously have more We're like, no, it's very easy to believe that. But actually, when we put our mind to it, actually, we can find a way through. But it's that almost like a a bank account of drive. How do you actually keep growing that drive? Because some people would say that there's there's an inextricable link between drive and energy. Like I'm high energy unless I'm not, and then I'm replenishing in order to actually build my energy again. And I know you're high energy and drive. So how do mothers and women grow this drive? Other than I hear doing being an inspiration, but... There's a very, very very practical key thing. You have to create a bubble. You have to be in a bubble. You have to protect yourself. Like this, this person is, uh, that you mentioned, she's way too much exposed to her mother-in-law. I understand you can't completely <laughs> eradicate your mother-in-law from your life, but you, know, you, can, you, you can compartmentalize and you can reduce the, the exposure to people who take your drive away, who take your energy away. So you have to be very selective. You have to create a bubble where you protect yourself, you protect your energy, your ideas, your your soul, your drive, your your spark. So if you just let anybody kind of walk in and out with dirty feet, whichever way they want, sure, it will, your, your drive is full of holes, it will leak into the universe and you have nothing. So create yourself a bubble, which means being very selective with um, how you spend your time, where you spend your time, what kind of environment, you know, coming down to how clean your house is, you know. Is is your environment uh, boosting your energy or is it taking it away? And this applies to absolutely everything. People, your home, you know, what you eat, how you interact, yeah, what books you read, do you watch TV or you go for a walk in the forest. So all these choices. So bubble, that's my tip. We can all create a bubble to some extent. It's never going to be a perfect bubble, yeah. but um, we have to keep working on our bubble. Yeah, it's perfect what you say, because I was thinking that perhaps we sometimes, we have to be careful, we have to be selective with who we share our, our ideas with or our inner dreams with, because it sounds like if we take that example, this older mum in law, she's coming at it with her own lens and her own her own generational lens, but also her actual experience of raising children and what's possible. And I'm guessing that that's really driving her that her opinion about what should happen for her daughter in law. And now I haven't I have a a fairly good, I would say pretty good actually, um, sense of if I've got a question to ask and I've got an idea, you know, something's going around in my head, I have a pretty good idea of what the, the people in my life that are in my life, what they'll say about it. You know, I'll have a hunch mm-hmm. if there's a naysayer. And I don't, uh, in my life, I don't have many people, if any, that would close things down. I don't mean if I came to them with a harebrained, stupid idea that they would say, hey, that's really great. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. I mean I mean they have my best interests, that they that they are sufficiently attuned to the person I am 
and that they can keep their own agendas clean with mine. So I think, I think there is a, there is a really big place. It's, we're coming back to being around people who are open and honest and raw and vulnerable and, and playing the same game as you, actually. Yeah, like-minded. People who also want to find their drive. Yes. Like, it doesn't mean that you... Yes, you so they're not going to be... You know, going to be. Yeah, they know that it's going to be a journey. People are positively on that journey, trying to find their drive, trying to honor their drive every day. Uh-huh. And I, I think one, one sort of... Uh, one thing that people always think that, you know, okay, uh, it's very good for her to say she's got her bubble. No, I worked on my bubbles. I worked on my bubble for years. Bubbles don't just land on you. Everybody starts in a very chaotic place. But one person by so person mm-hmm. by person, little by little, you start clearing out your path. You start clearing it out and you start protecting yourself. So it is a journey. But you've got to get there in order to preserve so that you can, you can be driven. Yeah, to preserve your drive for the things that you really want. I have a little question for you. Do you have a very tidy house? No, nope. I have a clean house because we have a cleaner once a week. But I don't have a tidy house because um, I never pick children's toys out of an impulse. I think this is, this is key to success. You have slots when you pick up toys and when you clean and organize. And then other times... You never act on an impulse. So I have very clear slots when I... So how, how, do, how do you live? How do I live? I walk over Legos all the time or, or Nerf guns. Sometimes I, uh, I stream them on my uh, Instagram live stream, going up and down the stairs. All sorts of things I find. I never pick them up except when it's time to pick them up. So no impulsive cleaning. <laughs> it's funny. I, I see some of this as you protecting yourself from... It's like that would be a distraction from the drive that you have. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, of course, I made one or two mistakes in my life and started picking up Legos. We all know <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, 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 it's a hole. It's a trap. You'll never come out of that. It's a constant, you know, chaos. You, you, you go into that hole and, you, you know, you disappear. So for myself, inside of me, there's a very clear rule. No impulsive. No impulsive cleaning whatsoever. And yes, my husband suffers and he goes, and how many days have these, you know, this jumper has been here on the, on the stairs? And I go, mm, three days. I'll pick it up a uh, day after tomorrow because then it's my <laughs> cleaning slot. And so be it. It can be a little bit painful, but they all used to. They get used to it. It's really refreshing. I'm so glad you're telling us this because... I'm quite the opposite. So in order for my my creative, productive, generative self to have a connection to my drive, I actually need a really harmonious, really super tidy home. Oh, I have a couple of those rooms. Don't get me wrong. So where I work is tidy. Mm-hmm. And no kids allowed. That's my office. And also the uh, sitting room is tidy at all times in case somebody pops in for a drink or a tea or something. So I have, again, bubbles, protected areas from chaos, but where the life happens, where the kids run around, then I just close my eyes when it's not time to uh, tidy up. So you can have it both ways. I know what I need to do. Thank you for helping. I need to take my contact lenses out. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) There we go. (laughs) I can, I can see it's it's hard. It wasn't easy in the beginning, but I, yeah. you know, my kids are nine. Besides, the good news is also they get used to that their mother is not there to pick up after them. I told them this morning when I had not packed yeah. their bags or done, you know, all of this stuff when I was driving them to school. I said, you know, I never pack your bags. Yes, yes, mommy. You know that I'm here to give you kisses and feed you and love you, but I will not tidy up your room or pack your bags. Yes, mommy, I know. Mm. Yeah, this is, this is such good lessons for nine-year-old boys or any children, actually. It's enormously, 
important to get those boundaries clear. Yeah, my, my children are a complete mess. They're two very energetic boys. They are like a tornado at all times. So anybody thinking, oh, it's good for her to say because uh, her children are these the tidiest daughters. No, they are not. <laughs> they are the messiest boys. So, <laughs> you know, you just have to wait that Friday comes and then you clean it up or they clean it up. Mm. So some of the takeaways for listeners from this are that that in order to, to maintain your drive, you need to protect your energy bubbles, not only within your own internal system, your physical system, but actually in your external system, your home, your relationships, everything about it, really. And to be vigilant about that, get clear about which bubbles you need to create, and then get ruthless about keeping your bubbles. And to, yeah, navigate, navigate in order to keep your drive and to focus your drive in a way that has you make the impact that you want or do the job that you want or achieve what you want, whatever that is, but to actually the doing, the being present with yourself and the inspiration are critical parts of growing your drive and and excavating for it actually. Um, And that really mothers have this incredible opportunity to stay close to cycles, to, yeah, just just to be really clear that motherhood actually is a unique opportunity to mine for even more drive for yourself, rather than listen to that narrative that says, nah, it's over. You know, it's like, nah, nothing for you now. It's quite the opposite, Misa. And I watched you create so much in the world in many spheres across different entrepreneurial adventures and endeavors. And I think in the time that I've known you, your drive seems to be growing. Yes. You walk your talk on this and you lie quiet sometimes, you know, and use that time. So I actually see you living this model, living it. And it's wonderful. And the life working groups in Driven Women are are very unique groups where women, as you say, like-minded women who are growing their drive in order to make things happen. Yeah. I mean, they're a force. They're a really big force. Tell us, tell the listeners about your groups. I mean, how many have you got right now? Oh, Gosh, we have 50 group leaders. So we have more than 50 groups that that would be UK, Switzerland, Finland, Paris, Germany, Sydney, quite all over the place. But I I think the key thing of the life working groups is, and whether you're a mother or not, when you try to, when you honor your drive, your spark, you want to achieve something, do something, express your purpose in the world, you need structure, you need a process. Hmm. You need the boundaries, and that's what the life working groups, beyond you know support and um, the beautiful exchange that happens in the group, it gives you the structure because basically what we do, we show up once a month, which is a manifestation to yourself saying, I honor my drive, I honor this, I show up once a month, and I'm present with my dreams. I'm trying to figure out how I can make them happen. And I share these experiences with other women, which then helps them and it helps me through those stories, through those experiences. But not only that, then I commit to five steps at the end of each meeting. And I will report back in a month's time how the month went, how those five steps that I thought are crucial for me to move forward, how those went. So it keeps the momentum It's a wonderful accountability process. Yeah, exactly. And it gives you the structure. So you can't just start drifting around because you have to be present with yourself once a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, it really, really is an amazing accountability process and network and space to be thoroughly present with yourself and what you want to achieve, you know, what you want to do to become more of a doer but from a place of being and I think that's what's really refreshing about this you know driven woman network and the quality of the achievements the accomplishments of the 
the women's, you know, and they're not all mothers, of course, but, you know, are extraordinary, you know, and, and really making a big difference in the world. So, and right across, as you can hear, you know, Mises, Mises Network, you know, goes right the way to Sydney, um, which is wonderful. And there are big plans in uh, afoot as well. So for more. So, I mean, this is this has been a wonderful conversation that's really different because I think so often we don't hear about this thing called drive. And I'm truly grateful that you would come and share and help listeners consider how they're growing their own drive to do what they want in the world. And I'm really, really grateful, Misa, because there's no one like you. There's no, nothing like driven no. woman <laughs> at all. <laughs> no, there really isn't. So there is. I take that. And yeah, I agree. There isn't anything like that. Yeah. So, and you're the perfect, perfect founder. Yeah. People like to consume. And I, I, I always say, I don't care about inspiration. I want to see movement. That's why it's so unique. Yes. Inspiration is fabulous, but movement and action, that when they're combined, it's a force to be reckoned with, as certainly yeah. I would say you are. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you thank you it's been way. such pleasure always love talking to you and this is of course my favorite topic so i couldn't thank be you. happier thank you it's such an honor mm. to be on your podcast thank you there we have it misa makes such a lovely distinction between drifting and being driven i found that so helpful and i hope you did too in fact the whole question about doing and being quiet is a great one. And that kind of seasonal, cyclical aspect of this, oh my gosh, that's so important. You know what I really also personally liked was the way that Misa has a three-way pathway of drive, that being, doing, inspiration. So don't forget to go and check her out online and on social. She's really active. There's loads of incredible resources that Misa offers you know, free. And her driven woman life working groups around the world are so impactful. They're growing each year, each month. And I've been to the Festival of Doers Day event. In fact, I've spoken at several and they are rocking events. I highly recommend those days. The last one I went to and spoke at was in September in Zurich. Oh, it was like sustenance. It was nourishment for the hundreds of women that were there. So I really super recommend you to go find out about Mises Driven Woman Network and everything that she does. So by the way, this episode on Drive really neatly links with the School for Mothers next live event. We have one coming up in January. And this event is coming to Brighton, which absolutely is close to where I live. And I'm so excited because a lot of the time I spend working away, you know, thousands of miles or hundreds of miles away from where I actually live. So it's a real treat to be right on my own doorstep and actually be having a School for Mothers event. It's on January the 10th in the evening and it's party style. The last one that we did in London in November was very much workshop, intimate workshop style. This one isn't. It's party style with a show in it with a side of networking. So for once, I'm going to be asked loads of questions about what it's like to be a mum of 10 and a career woman and possibly why it's taken me so long to share my story. And I have no doubt there'll be other cringe making questions. So I'm going to be in conversation with Emma Stroud. She's a superstar comedian, very well known. She's an award winning TED Talk speaker. She's an MC and a speaker mentor. There is so much to Emma. She's very, very funny. So I know we're going to have a real hoot that night. And there'll also be a Q&A with the audience, plus lots of soft drinks, bubbles, balloons. It's a party. Think post-Christmas party. In fact, I'll be honest. Think the kids have gone back to school. It's called Me, Me, Me. Believe me, listeners, it's not about Danusha. It's about everyone that comes. It's about you. It's a celebration of us amazing mothers. So 
It's my kind of night. I like partying. If you're in Brighton or the surrounding area in the UK and you'd like to join us, go to schoolformothers.com, head to the event page in the top menu and you'll see details for the Eventbrite checkout. I'll pop all the details in the show notes too. While I'm really aware that next week, on Tuesday, the day for our next episode, it's Christmas Day. We're continuing with another magnificent mother rocking it out into the world. It's a really special day. Of course it is. It's Christmas Day. And even if you don't celebrate Christmas, the world around you will be celebrating. Many, many people will be celebrating Christmas. So I had to really think on who I want to share with you on that big day. It had to be a total superstar, and I know I've done you all really proud. So next week's episode is called Enough, and I'm joined by best-selling author, motivational speaker, leading celebrity therapist, and pioneering hypnotherapist trainer, Marissa Peer. I know that Marissa and I will have a profound and impactful talk on the importance of learning to believe that we're enough. Yep that we are absolutely enough. I cannot wait. Same time, same place. Why don't you meet me here? I know it's a big day. Thank you for joining us again. Here's to you. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 